Hello and welcome back to the Reapers. We hope you're doing very well. Back on to our Bombers of the World series. So what we do is we talk about bombers. We've got this excellent picture of the internet. We can zoom in we and zoom out. Um, and we go through the bombers and talk about them. Now our usual disclaimer, we are not aviation experts. We are not historical experts. We're just plain enthusiasts. We got our information from internet books, stuff like that. We just like talking about them for fun, basically. So we did this column, um, the Lancaster down to whatever that is. Um, last time and then we had a few months off because I've been sick and now we're going to try and do column two so without further ado let's have a little look so the manufacturer we're on is Douglas which I don't know any Douglas planes so uh, that's not going to be good and the first plane we've got is something called a Bravo 66 destroyer uh, all I can tell is that it's American because it's Douglas and it's got an American flag on it and that it's got two underslung wing mounted jet engines and that's literally all I know about it and a raised kind of quite high tailplane um, Soames, what have you got on this? When was it uh, When was it built first of all? 50s Yeah, it looks very 50s it's got a pretty blunt nose, it doesn't look particularly fast Looks like it was replaced, uh, as I understand it, to the A26 uh, Vader so was the invader before this or after this? This was before it. Okay. Kind of looks like a big S3 Viking. Yeah, it does. It is a bit of a stretch Viking, isn't it? Um, okay. And did you say it was fifties? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Um, it was a bomber, so it's got a, it's got a little gun at the back by the looks of it. So I'm assuming there's no obvious outside mounted uh, stores pylon, so I assume it's going to have a bomb bay. Have we got any idea of payload of uh, in on the internet, or whatever you're reading? Uh, looking at uh, Wikipedia, mm -hmm. um, 1956 is when it was introduced. Mm -hmm. and it looked like the build about 290 bomb load. Couldn't tell you. Haven't got any inform information on. Roger, what have we got about those engines then? They're turbojet or turbofan, presumably. Do we have a power on those engines? It's uh, two times Allison J71 A-11 or-13 turbo. Just a hair over 10,000 pound feet of thrust each. Right, so we've got 10,000 pounds each. Do we have a top speed on this bird? 548 knots. I assume that's uh, true, air, true air speed. Mm, right. Yeah. I don't know about the Mach, though. About 0.7 by the sounds of it. Okay, fine. Um, and do we know if this all servers at all? It, would, it was the Korean War time, so do we know if it's all service in the Korean War? Uh, it looks like it certainly saw first service during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, the RB-66 um, was used in uh, that, that was specifically the ele electronic version, I believe. Hmm. Yeah, it was used for as electronic warfare during the Vietnam War. Right, so it's, I see. So it did have some use. Oh, it looks like the, looks like the platform was adapted from its original intent as a bomber and used instead as an electronic warfare platform. So from the RB, which is like the designation for the uh, electronic reconnaissance version, and then you got the and ECM. Then they were reading to EB, I assume, for uh, to take mm -hmm. more of a ECM or jammer role. So it's like an early growler or something, or whatever they were called, an early raven. Basically, yeah. I mean, mm. then you also have fives jamming. I guess this is more of a heavier jamming platform. Well, Joan, do we know any idea when it went out of service? 1973. 73, it's just after Da Nang. All right, fair enough. Um, anything on the destroyer then before we send off on that? Okay, we move on to the English Electric Canberra. Now, this has a massive uh, service history and is highly revered, um, certainly in England, but in other places that use I think the Americans bought it as well. I think the Australians bought it. It was now it's super, super old um, and it was a bomber. It had the um, engines kind of like a third of the way down the wings and it had a massive wing and hence it could fly really really high we'll get the surface ceiling from the boys in a minute and it was just a really successful bomber presumably uh, first designed as a nuclear bomber but it would have had presumably provision for conventional bombs as well um, we've got some facts on this chaps let's have a look at the engines first what motors have we got in there Two times Rolls Royce uh, Avon Mark 109 turbojets. That's got the Avons, and what power are they at? 
7,400 pounds each. And then we've got a service ceiling and a top speed on this bird. Uh, 48,000 feet. 48, was feet and uh, made of climb 3,400 feet per minute. I thought it went a lot higher than that. It must be just me thinking. You, you might be thinking of the American version, because I know uh, n the Americans made their own version of the Pambra. Uh, yeah. I believe they're currently still in service with, uh, with NASA. Yeah, they've got the. I think it's the B fifty seven. So we'll come to that. Yes, it must be an up, probably an upgraded version. Right. So it's got a pair of Avons. It's got a big funky wing. Uh, we're pretty sure it's designed as a nuclear bomber initially. Do we have a payload, maximum payload on this bird, and a maximum speed, please? Speed mark point eight eight. Uh, pretty far. Armament loaded, loaded weight was forty six thousand pounds or twenty thousand eight hundred sixty. Armament eight thousand pounds of bombs. And Two times air to service missiles. Oh, yeah, uh, air to service missiles. What were they, ball pops or something? AS 30s, not sure what they are. Okay, must be an early guided type of one kind. The AS 30s these these are quite service. a lot of. Yeah. These are quite a lot of service outside of the UK, actually. Uh, one of my prayer instructors actually flew the camera back in the day for the Indian Air Force. Yeah, they're very popular in other countries. Uh, they were, they're really highly revered around the world, these planes. Uh, it's just it's just a design that worked for some reason. It's also it was introduced in the what, early fifties at a time where you know you just, just fresh out of World War Two and everyone was buying planes left and right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Anything else about the camera that you guys can think about that's interesting? Okay, we will move on. We're cracking through these today. Uh, and if you've got more information, just interesting points about these planes, then let us know in the comments as well, anyone that's watching, because it's just interesting. General Dynamics F111. Now, this is a pretty awesome plane. It's out of service now. Um, they call it the Pig here, but it was called something else. What was it called? Um, the... Uh, Aardvark. Aardvark, yeah. I don't know why it's called the Pig here. Um, pretty awesome plane. It's got... Uh, two-seater but they're side by side with like an ejection capsule um, very expensive to get this plane into service and it had all sorts of problems I remember I remember it saw service in in a Libyan conflict um, and they flew them over from America to England and they landed in England and then they stepped from England down to kind of Africa and down to Libya and then by the time they got in, there in Iraq, got right? Iraq yeah yeah and uh, half of them had broken down by that point when they when they got down to the Libyan conflict, I remember. Uh, 1960s plane, um, twin engine. Was it twin fit? No, single fin, wasn't it? I think the yeah, I think main figure about it was it's it's got a variable sweep wings, so the wings could sweep back like a tomcat, and they could get these really fast. I think it had a max speed of 2.5. Facts and figures, chaps. Um, what max speed you got on this bird? Maximum speed was Mach 2.5 yeah. uh, or 1,650 so that's miles. That's the same as an F-15. So that's like one of the fastest planes in the world, basically. Well, it, this was designed to be a low-level supersonic, so Mach 1.2 at sea level. It's still pretty fast though at sea level. That's kind very of fast. It's, it's speed. speed. Fun fact: This was actually a, think of it as a precursor to the Tomcat. Is this had a two times the TF-30, same engine as the F-14. Ah, I didn't know that. What power they can the F-11? Uh, 17,900 pounds uh, dry, and with afterburners, 25,000 Roger. Okay, so power, powerful motors, extremely fast. Like Warren said, low level, this was designed as a low level bomber to go in under radar. Um, I think, I think from memory, they had a kind of um, terrain tracking radar where they could essentially let yep. it fly itself. Terrain following. Roger. I'm presuming it didn't have an intercept radar. I don't, there wouldn't be any point of it carrying missiles and being an interceptor, would it? I don't think so. However, this was um, originally intended to uh, be the fleet defense center for the Navy before the F-15 came into service, so they made the F-11B. However, the Navy wasn't really happy with it. It was hard to land. The carrier was mm -hmm. both inferior and capable as a fighter. Uh, and also, all the all around unreliability of it. It's mm -hmm. my to show the Tomcat. So, right, so this is the precursor to the Tomcat then. 
Uh, so it was going to be used by the Navy, but they used the Tomcat instead. Okay, that's fine. Interesting. Do we have uh, a max... I oh, know it's not a high fighter, but out of interest, a max service ceiling and a bomb load. Max service ceiling, uh, 66,000 feet. Wow. Uh, bomb load, armament, uh, carry... Uh, oh, it's got a weapons bay, apparently, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Capacity thirty one thousand five hundred pounds. So that's a hell of a lot, and it's a it's a pretty big bird, but that's like four times as much capacity as a as a excuse me as a Canberra. So that's a pretty impressive bird, really. It'll be one I'll be interested in seeing in DCS having two pilots, or you know what I mean, two crew members flying on the deck between valleys and stuff like that. I think that'd be pretty awesome. Okay, anything else about? the aardvark before we um sign off on that uh just that the the aardvark obviously what we look the picture we're looking at there is is the pig variant i know they also did the raven variant as well ah oh, so talk me between the differences of the aardvark the pig and the raven the pig was uh for strategic bombing uh, as i understand mm -hmm. it um, so uh, for nuclear weapons using the agm 69 short range uh and the Raven was, uh, again, re this is to replace the B-66 destroyer that we looked at earlier, mm -hmm. the electronic version, mm -hmm. uh, and was used specifically for electronic. And that was the one that had the big pod on top of the tail fin, wasn't it? The Raven. That's right, yes. Yeah. And do we know what the Aardvark was then? Was that just the precursor, the earlier one? The Aardvark, that was predominantly for tactical uh, bombing as opposed to strategic bombing. Right. The Aardvark, that's the 111C, isn't it? Unknown. Oh, no, that's a pig. No. The the armor is just the basically the base model. Okay, cool. Nice one, chaps. Got plenty of information there. Um, can't think of anything to add to myself. But again, anything else you guys know about it? Send. Uh, right. Moving on to one of the three British V bombers. Uh, after the Second World War, these are three really impressive birds. So after the Second World War, they wanted fast large nuclear bombers to go bomb Ma Moscow basically and they came up with three god knows where they had three but they did they had Vulcan which is over there absolute beast of a plane a uh, very revered British plane they had the Valiant which I'm looking for it is on here so I think that's the Valiant um, and they had the Victor I know the Victor was very successful probably the most successful I don't know if they had the most of them built but these were used as nuclear bombers. They were never actually dropped any nuclear bombs, obviously. And then after that, they were um, converted and used for other things. I think uh, they were used for air-to-air refuelers and whatnot. Um, they got the engines in the wings, in the, in the housing of the inner wings, swept back wings for maximum speed. Um, I have the pleasure of, when I, well, when I get better and I can move about again, um, they have one of these at Brandingthorpe where they do... Um, fast taxi runs and I'll go and get some videos of those doing fast taxi runs it's very impressive because you can go really close to it get getting the jet stream of the engines is really impressive um, so guys let's start let's start getting some facts and figures down when was this introduced I know it's 50s but we've got sort of date in there so introduced April 1958 and retired in 1993 excellent so 93 takeaway 58 what's that that is 93 to take away 58. That's 35 year service. Pretty impressive. And like we said, Pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. 86. Yeah, 86 built. 86 built. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, obviously, uh, not just used as the V uh, force, but also as um, refueling mm -hmm. vehicles. Yeah, and it did very well at that. A um, couple more facts and figures. Just for interest and comparison, um, we'll have top speed and service seating, please. Maximum speed was 627 miles per hour, or 545 knots. Mm -hmm. Service ceiling was 56,000 feet, or 17,000 meters. Pretty impressive. How many engines did it have, and what engines were they? Uh, Armstrong Sidley Sapphire turbojet engines. Uh, as to the number, can't see. I think it had four for memory. I remember seeing it four exhaust pipes. So they got power on them. Yeah, it was for Armstrong City Sapphire. Uh, power was eleven thousand and fifty pounds uh, feet. Great, it's just forty-four thousand pounds or something. So it's, you know, it's pretty impressive, and they do sound great when they when they're on full chuff. Um, 
I always remember the distinctive front section. You see it bulges down there at the front. I'm guessing that's for extra fuel. I don't really know what that is. And the kind of weird window layout, whereas you've got the Vulcan, which has just one or two kind of panes of, of window. This has multiple panes of window. And I think it's two crew member in there at the front. Probably a uh, navigator, a bomber and stuff at the back of the cockpit. Um, yeah. Yes. Crew of five, and and you're right. I mean, with designing a bit, the design a bit is very, very distinctive. Mm, absolutely. Um, did it see? I know it didn't drop any bombs, but did you see any other distinctive service? I don't think it was in used in the Argentinian conflict. Uh, um, uh, uh, as as a refueling vehicle, I believe it's it was what uh, refueled the Vulcans um, on their their journey from Ascension. I see. So that's when they did their massive kind of round the world trip, and, and they must have had a chain of these victors uh, refueling. I expect they must have a massive range of these victors, and that's hence why they were so good at uh, being a refueler because they could stay airborne for so long. Mm, okay. Indeed, indeed. Very distinctive tail, uh, T tail fin as well. Okay. Anything to add to the victor before we sign off on that? Um, other than its last operational sort of um, duties was during the invasion of Q8 uh, by, by Iraq in 1998. Oh, Eight victors were sent over to Bahrain to provide in flight refueling. Yeah, and that's the colour scheme that's in now, the desert, so refueling. Okay, so dis in distinctive service history, highly revered. Um, pretty good plane. Good. And like I said, we've still, we, have, we don't have them flying anymore, but we've got them running. Um, full power at Brundingthorpe, so we've still used, we've still got them here. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's move on to the Illusions, champs. We've got three planes here. I've no idea what any of these are, uh, so let's just go at it blind. Uh, first of all, we're starting off with an IL-28 Beagle. Uh, that when, what kind of time are we in history at this point? Uh, we're looking at uh, first flight was in 1948, just after the Second World mm -hmm. War. It was actually introduced into service during the 1950s and retired during the 1980s, um, wow. whilst, whilst Russia was still the Soviet Union. Soviet Union, yeah. So three decades of using this weird old post World War II plane. That's pretty impressive, whatever you say. So you've got a little gunner at the back there with his gun. Um, you've got a pilot and you've got presumably a bomber in the front there in the nose. You've got twin wing-mounted engines. I'm guessing they're wing-mounted. I only get a side view here. Tell me about those engines. Must be pretty, um, pretty old. Yeah, two Klimov uh, BK1A turbojets, uh, producing 5,952 pounds feet each. Mhm. And would we have a top speed and a service of this service ceiling of this plane? So maximum speed was 902 kilometers or 487 knots. Mm -hmm. Cruise speed 770 kilometers, and the service ceiling uh, was 12,300 meters or 40,000 feet. Pretty impressive for 1948. I've got to admit, that's a pretty cool plane. Okay. It was, uh, and it looks as though it had uh, quite a, uh, a decent export history as well. Okay, so where did it get hit, uh, exported to? Pretty much everywhere: nice. uh, Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria. Pretty much on every single continent, I would suggest. Wow, I'm guessing out of Bombay. Do we have a bomb load on this thing? It's very Bombay, small. Bombay, 3,000 kilograms, 6,600 uh, pounds. Okay, it makes sense. Very small. I'm just looking for something to compare it to, like an F-15 there. So it's, so it's got three guys in it, a big Bombay, and it's smaller than an F-15. So it's an interesting plane. But successful history, as we've heard, so it obviously did well. All right, very good. Anything to add to the Beagle? Nothing to add here. Okay. Next, we're moving on. They've increased their size. It's the same design philosophy. It literally looks like an enlarged beagle. We've got an IL-46. The back's identical, the middle's identical, and the front's identical. It's just scaled up, basically. What information have we got on the IL-46? When was it in service? Uh, in service, uh, 1952, and uh, according to Wikipedia, only one was built. Oh. Okay. That's so I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, Doesn't sound right. It looks... Oh, mm, okay. So just a prototype as far as we know. It, like it was just a prototype, yeah. Out of interest, we've got facts and figures. That's a big motor it's got there. If this is scaled right on my picture, it's a whopping uh, it's, motor. Yeah, two... Uh, uh, 
copyrights. Luca, AI Alpha. Luca, yeah. Uh, Eleven thousand and twenty-five pounds feet each. Big motors, so it's doubled the power. Um, and do we have a speed and ceiling on this thing? A max speed, uh, nine hundred twenty-eight kilometers or five to seven miles per. Service ceiling was twelve thousand seven hundred meters, which is about um, what? Uh, Thirty, forty thousand feet. Okay, this is pretty impressive, and that's a fast jet as well. Um, it's just, as far as we can see, it was just a prototype. If you know anything more about the IL forty six, let us know in the comments. Was that a bit interesting piece of history? Anything else that we know about it? Um, nothing here. As I say, I mean, very, very limited mm -hmm. information on, on uh, Wikipedia. Um, yeah, couldn't really add any, any more to. It. Mm, I guess it was just never really put into history. Okay, fair enough. Right, well, let's move on. They've modernised on the IL-54. They've sharpened the nose, got some aerodynamics. I see a swept wing. I see wing fences. I see two or four engines. I can't underslung on the wing. I can't tell which. Same kind of philosophy in that we've got a rear gunner housing at the back. We've got a pilot. We've got a bombardier in the front glass screen. Uh, when are we in history now? IL-54. Uh, 1955, again another prototype, uh, oh. two built this time on the IL-54. Okay, so it's obviously got no history per se, but um, uh, let's go for the motors, the speed and the service ceiling. Um, okay, so uh, two Luca AL-7s again, uh, 16,981 pounds feet uh, of thrust each. Mm -hmm. That was the first prototype. The second prototype uh, had uh, two Luca AL-7F which had 22,100 pound feet. Mm -hmm. The second prototype looks like it had an after burning um, capabilities, whilst uh. the first prototype used water injection. Okay, right, so IL 46 and 54 were built, but they were just prototypes, never in service, but they're pretty cool. Did it have top speed on that 54, by the way? It looks actually quite fast. Yeah, the first one, first prototype, 1,150 kilometres per hour. Second prototype, 1,250 kilometres per hour. So you're getting near supersonic. Seven, getting close to supersonic, if not over. Impressive bird. Very impressive. OK. Shame they never built that, but all right. Fair enough. Let's move on to something completely different. Uh, America's first pop-up proper stealth aircraft. Now, um, obviously, they had stealth elements before this. Radar Stealth was an, was a, they're aware of it in the SR seventy one and whatnot, in material type, in geometry, uh, um, whatnot. But this is the first one that was designed to essentially be invisible, wasn't it? And um, you can see the limitations of the design that they had at the at, at the time because it's very flat faceted. It's not smooth. It's not particularly aerodynamic. But you know, it saw service, it was successful, it's relatively highly revered. We're talking about the F-117 Nighthawk. I know very little about this, uh, apart from what I've said, and it had a, a bomb bay, obviously, and it was based around guided weapons, GBUs and whatnot. Uh, when are we in history for this? 90s? Late 80s? Uh, it was introduced, actually, in October 1983, which is quite surprising. That uh, is. But it did remain secret for an awfully long while, didn't it? I remember um, it was probably the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. It first saw sort of uh, recognisable... Um, so seven or eight years, no one knew about it, basically. Yeah, indeed. Hmm, interesting. It must have been an absolute dog to fly, so it must have had fly-by-wire, because there's no way anyone could drive that thing about. Was it a single pilot? Uh, yes, it was. I believe it was a single pilot's vehicle. Okay. Uh, we know it saw action in, in um, the first Gulf War, because I remember it dropping bombs. And one did actually get shot down. Was it in... I think it was in the f first Gulf War. One got shot down by a SAM. Or it may have been Afghanistan. I can't remember. But I do remember one did get shot down. It wasn't in the Balkans, was it? I half remember Yeah, something. maybe yeah. that was the Balkans. And I remember them gloating about it because they'd managed to get a lock on it. Um, so relatively, you know, primitive. I mean, 1983 is pretty impressive. I mean, you've got to think of the state of computers back then. Um, you know, it was like monochrome, reel-to-reel -reel type stuff, you know. And they managed to design this. It was pretty impressive. Um, let's go over some facts and figures, shall we? I uh, know it's not meant to be, these things aren't meant to be fast or high-flying, but out of interest, we have a top speed and server ceiling. Max speed was um, Mach 0.92, 679. Impressive. Server ceiling was 45,000 feet. 
45 okay that's quite low I guess it must have quite a high wing loading or something um, what have we got in the way of motors two general uh, general electric f404 uh, turbo fans uh, producing nine uh, ten thousand six hundred pounds feet mm -hmm. I remember uh, the front intakes I think they had a, like a kind of gridded louvre uh, rather than being open um, to stop they did uh, it was to, it was to kind of prevent mm. sort of IR uh, signatures mm. and must have, must have had some fancy exhaust as well to kind of yeah keep that as cool as possible so pretty cool play a uh, pretty interesting time in history nothing else there's no contemporaries as far as I'm aware stand to be corrected um, in history so you know pretty brave design philosophy um, yeah um, it was retired in 2008 which oh, wow. again surprises me I thought they, they were still flying yeah I thought no I thought they were retired early I thought they were retired just after the first Gulf War I didn't know they went all the way on to 2008 it's pretty impressive um, alright fair enough nice bit of history learned there. anything to add to the Nighthawk nope Right, we, we want to Martin, which I believe is American. Uh, never seen this thing. Ugliest looking plane I've ever seen. XB51. Anything on this weird chap? I'm just going to talk a little bit while I'm waiting. Weird, tiny little cockpit, presumably for a bubble cockpit for aerodynamic purposes. Fuselage, excuse me, external mounted jet engines. Weird. A weird looking semi swept back wing. Looks like it's too small to fly. A massive fuselage, presumably for a bomb load, and a high-mounted T tailplane. So everything screams weird about this. Yeah, even the fact that it's got XB in its title, mm -hmm. uh, which denotes it's ex experimental. It's a prototype. Uh, looks like they built the two, um, and it's interestingly lost out um, in evaluation to the English Electric. Right. So we're talking fifties back now, then. So this was America's build, if you like, to combat the or, or compete with the English electric camera, which we've talked about over here. But it didn't succeed. Do we know why it didn't succeed? It just lost out. I mean, in, in, in evaluation, it looks like the electric, English electric camera uh, was much more superior um, or uh, it was easier to produce, easier to fly mm -hmm. and a little more standard, I would suggest, looking at the mm -hmm. design thing. Uh, again, interestingly, uh, it was Martin who um, built the Canberra under license in America. Mm. Um, so although they lost out on the XB-51, they ultimately gained by building the Martin B-57 Canberra. Okay, before we um, scrub off the XB-51 then, do we have the usual facts and figures, top speed, ceiling, bomb load? Maximum speed is 644 miles per hour. Surface ceiling, 41,750 feet. Bombs up to ten thousand four hundred pounds. So it carries a little more bombs than the carrier uh, camera. It can't go as high, presumably because of that wing loading, and it's a little bit slower, I think. Okay, fair enough. XP five one. That's a bit of history learned. Now we move on to the Martin camera, the B fifty seven. So they built these under license, did you say? Yes, that's right. Well, it's a slightly uh, d a slightly different design, but uh, yeah, it's ultimately a camera. Okay, what well, things I notice that are different are it seems to have pods on the end of the wings, which are presumably fuel pods. Um, it's got two seats rather than one seat. What was that doctrine? Do we know? Yeah, I'm not seeing any information on that one at the moment. Mm, unless it was literally a training version that I've got here. It might be a training version that we're showing here. Maybe. I mean, um, the standard uh, B57 Canberra. It had a similar sort of cockpit layout to the Canberra, to the mm. English electric. Roger. Okay, we've been over the facts and figures of the camera, so we don't need to. It's pierce a bit identical airframe otherwise. Um, anything else to point out on the B57B? Did it see any service? Not as far as I'm aware. Uh, operational history. Again, it looks limited. Yeah, I can't see anything outstanding. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I beg your pardon. It looks like it was um, party to the Vietnam War uh, early on. Um, so, Da Nang um, in nineties. Roger. Okay. It's interesting. There's something else I didn't know. Right. So, it just shows the, um, the popularity of the Canberra airframe. Uh, why it's so revered. Again, we've got one at Bruntingthorpe. Uh, can't fly, but it can do fast taxis, and it's impressive. One thing to note, when they start the engines, they've got uh, explosive uh, charges they put in the engines. 
they, they explode them, that gets the compressor turning, and when it explodes, you've got all that entire plane just gets covered in black smoke. Um, it'll be on the internet somewhere if you if you Google it on YouTube. It's quite impressive. Um, it, was, it was because it was um, uh, to you know get them up and scramble them to again drop bombs on Moscow, presumably. Right, very good. Uh, next, let's move on to McDonnell Douglas. So this is where McDonnell and Douglas have merge and you've got something that I've never heard of called a flying uh, wing called an A12 Avenger 2 no idea whatsoever all I can see is a flying wing and it looks like it'd be modern nowadays what well, have got a time in history of this and I guess it's a prototype uh, I got the prototype stage uh, the information I've got it was uh, a mock-up only uh, mm. no, no, none were built uh, and it was cancelled way before it even got to um, uh, construction Right. Do we know when this was in history, just out of interest? No. Uh, it developed, the, developed, the program was cancelled in 1991. So quite a late, quite a late program. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Fair enough. Well, people, internet people, with your big brains, let us know what you think of the A12 Avenger, Avenger and see if we get anyone that, that knows on it, anyone that worked on it, anyone that knows of it. That would be appreciated. Right, move on to something much more well-known, F-15E Strike Eagle. So presumably built on the chassis of the F-15C fighter, They've added a pilot, they've added side-mounted conformal wing tanks, uh, this kind of bulge here, for extra um, extra fuel. Otherwise, it seems, uh, no, they've added a lot more um, uh, weapon stations, and it's a strike aircraft, so a, a strike fighter, so it can carry um, air-to-air weapons, which I assume means it's still got its, um, its air-to-air uh, intercept radar. Uh, but it's also got uh, a bomb capability as well. Um, I don't know if I said, but it's two-seater now, so you've got a pilot and a weapons operator in the back. Um, when was the F-15E into service, please? Uh, 1985 um, to present day. So first flight was first flight was actually on 11th December 1986. 1986. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what I can say about them is I've got them based near me, RAF Lake and Heath. I've got uh, the 493rd F-15Cs and I've forgotten the squadron number of the F-15Es we've got there so I can get to see these any time. I'm very lucky. Um, well, let's talk about the motors. Um, what generation motors did these have? Did these have the Pratt & Whitney's? Uh, yes, uh, two Pratt & Whitney's F-100s. Yeah, 25,000 pounds of thrust with afterburner, same as the F-15C or thereabouts. Uh, they've been modernised to general electric engines nowadays with over 30,000 pounds of thrust, but that's non-historical, that's modern. Um, do we have a payload of air-to-ground weapons, or it might just give us a total payload? Seeing a total payload here. Mm -hmm. A variety of different air to service missiles and bomb loaders, mm -hmm. obviously. But but no weights as such. Okay, it's fair enough. It's gonna be big. It's gonna be twenty thousand pounds or something of payload, I'm, I imagine. Um we'll I reckon it's probably a plane a strike plane that will get in DTS world at some point, don't know when. I reckon someone will make one just because it's a it's a very well known fighter bomber basically. Um did it have an air-to-ground radar, do we know? It's going to have an air-to-air -air radar, because it's got AMRAMs and stuff. Do we, does it have something in air-to-ground radar? Uh, there's a wealth of information here. I'm not seeing anything on radar, though. Mm, OK, Internet, if you let us know if it does have a separate air-to-ground radar or if it's integrated with the main radar, that would be interesting. Um, anything else interesting to add to the F-15E? Not from me, Warren. More your field. Warren's gone to bed, I think. Uh, so it's going to be more or less the same top speed, Mach 2.5, I imagine, as the F-15C, and a ceiling of around 60,000 feet, I'd imagine. Okay, cool. And it can obviously drop, you know, it's a modern plane, it's a modern uh, strike, so it's going to drop GBUs, it's going to 
fire. I don't know if it fired air-to-surface missiles, as in Mavericks. Um, I don't know. Yes, uh, it, it did. Um, it used uh, AGM-65s, uh, also uh, Harpoon missiles for anti-shipping. So a bit of everything. What a and a variety. Of, pretty much everything, yeah. Anti-radiation missiles. Uh, a slammer, is that anti-radiation? Yeah, I think so, yeah. The two AGM-84s slammer missiles. Okay, so it's pretty versatile air-to-ground strike fighter bomber. Okay, cool. Okay, that's covered. Uh, right, now we move on to some big thumpers. Real, seriously big thumpers. We'll do a size comparison in a minute. Uh, no idea what this is. It's a... Can you pronounce that? Maya Sizhev. Didn't even know that company existed. We've got two whopping great planes, and a Mike 4 Bison and a Mike 50 Bounder. In fact, I do remember those names. Uh, so let's just have a look. Wow, and they're huge. That is probably, the Bounder is probably the biggest plane on here, I'd imagine, apart from the XP-70, which is just in a league of its own. Um, we've got some seriously, this look, it makes the B-52 look small. So let's start with the Bison. This looks like a plane that went into service, as I remember. Um, have we got a time in history for the Mike 4 Bison? Uh, introduced uh, into service in 1956. 56. Uh, so that's a that's a big brave plane to make in 1956, I think. Interestingly, um, it was retired in 1994, so wow. it's so long history. As yeah, it's a really successful like the B52. Um, it just looks like a weird mix of things, like a semi-swept back wing with fences, four engines built into the wings, the rear looks B-52 slash B-17-ish, the front looks like a B-25 or something. Ah, interestingly, it's bristling with machine guns, I see. Not man machine guns, but automated machine guns by the looks of it. It's going to have a whopping great bomb like Bombay. So let's talk about... Let's get our facts and figures done first of all. What are those motors? The power plant was four Mikulin yeah, AM3A turbojets, uh, 19,280 pounds feet of thrust. Wow, 19,000 pounds per, so that's 80,000 pounds for the entire airframe. It's not bad for 1956. These Russians were ahead in some ways, they're really good. Okay, um, we've got a speed and a ceiling of this thing. Maximum speed was 588 miles per hour, so again, quite quick, mm -hmm. I think, uh, when you, considering it's basically mm -hmm. service ceiling, uh, 11,000 meters or 36,000 feet. Roger. Now I see two or three bomb bays here. I'm not sure which, but that's going to be a relatively big payload. Do we know what payload this thing had? Uh, 19,840 pounds of internal stores uh, and up to 52... Um, £1,910 uh, could be carried in total, uh, obviously including nuclear uh, bombs as well. So the extra extra stores, I'm guessing they went on the wings, must have. Yes, yes, I'm guessing. They, they, is that a pylon that I can see there? I'm not sure. On that. I think the one at the bottom is a bomb bay open. That's all I can think that could yeah. be. Okay, so £56,000 is obviously leaps and bounds ahead of anything else. I know the V-52 was... The B-52 was in... No, the B-52 was designed in 1952. So it's a contemporary of the B-52, isn't it? Um, so that's what it was competing with. Okay, that's interesting. Um, did the Bison see any service, any action, do you know? Thumping great rudder on the thing. I'm not sure about any, any actual uh, uh, operational service. No action as such. Okay, and anything else you think? We've uh, got a quantity of crew, and anything else to add to the bison? No, I mean, when you can't see it on the picture that you have there, but uh, when you look at a plan view, um, again, very distinctive design, very, very long wingspan, mm. um, and considerably swept back, those wings are. Mm. For, it's an interest. for 1956, it's, it's pretty impressive. Okay, fair enough. So that's the bison. Um, let's move on to the bounder. Now I'm aware of the name, but I don't remember anything ever seeing any pictures of this. So this is interesting. Uh, first of all, it's enormous size. It's bigger than a B-52 and a Peacemaker. It's absolutely enormous. It looks like it's designed to be supersonic or transonic. You know, looking how sharp the nose is. 
Um, I really don't know where to start. When are we in history, and is this a real thing? Uh, well, only one was built, ah. and it looks like it might have been a static test frame, uh, but we're talking 1959. Um, wow. Again, weird design. Um, you've got uh, an engine under the wing there, but mm -hmm. you've also got an engine at the tip of the wing, which mm -hmm. is odd. Okay. Um, do so. We so we're not going to have any. Um, presumably, we're not going to have any facts and figures on speed and stuff if it never flew. Uh, we've got some sort of facts and figures. How, how where they got these from? I, I guess they might have estimated been data. Mm. Mm. Um, so maximum speed was one thousand two hundred twelve miles per hour. So yeah, absolutely. Impressive beast. Imagine that thing coming at you in nineteen fifty nine. So this was presumably designed to fly across the Atlantic or the North Pole and to, desi and to drop a nuclear bomb or multiple nuclear bombs on New York. I've no doubt that was the design, f design philosophy here. Um, who was this? Was this Stalin or Khrushchev or... I can't remember, 1959? 59 would have been Khrushchev, I believe. Roger. Okay, um, does it have an estimated payload or design payload? So, uh, yeah, 66,000 pounds of bombs uh, or missiles to be carried in the internal bay. So a big old payload there, 66,000 pounds. Impressive vehicle. It's like a B-52 with the wings swept really far back and going pretty much supersonic. So that's a scary thought and a very impressive piece of aviation engineering. Well, if they ever got it working. Uh, do we have Sounds like as if it did get it working. Uh, there seems to be some sort of reports from non um, sort of communist countries that they had seen it in flight. Mm, I, I just I, and Bounder is obviously a NATO uh, name, and I'd, if it hadn't flown or you know me taxied around, I'd surprised that NATO had named it. Um, out of interest, we've got some information on those motors. Just to see where we are in history and motor design. Uh, yeah, to Dobrinin uh, VD7 after burning turbojets. Ah, after burning turbojets. Any well, power rating on those? Yep, £30,865 thrust each. So that's a each. big old motor. Okay. Massive. Wow. So that, that was a powerful plane, big fuel load, drop some bombs, fly away as quickly as you can. Impressive. All right, then. Very good piece of history. Anything to add to the bounder? No, it might be doing some more digging around, though. No, uh, apparently it was involved in some sort of nuclear bomber hoax back in 1958. Uh, and uh, some article appeared in Aviation Week um, suggesting that uh, the Soviets made great progress in uh, <laughs> in, in their uh, nuclear aircraft. The Soviets do like their propaganda. Maybe, yeah, maybe it was maybe it was just a mock-up, just a scare, or something like that. There was a lot of lot of propaganda back then, wasn't there? Back then. There was uh, certainly was, uh, and Khrushchev was a master mm -hmm. uh, of that sort of stuff. And that, if I was whoever is. In, I, I can't remember who was in charge of America at the time, but whoever's in charge, something like that would be scary because you couldn't stop it. Um, how are you going to stop a supersonic bomber at 50,000 feet or whatever? So that's pretty... OK, that's an impressive bit of history, that is. OK, we shall move on to our last one today, which is a shame because it's been good fun. Uh, a North American A2B Savage. Never heard of the bloody thing. Looks like a little turboprop or piston prop. Um, when are we in history with the A2 Bravo Savage? Quite good question. Uh, I'm struggling to find any information for this. How about a North American Savage? Yep, got it. AJ Savage, A2 Savage. Okay, uh, yeah, 1950, uh, where it was introduced. Uh, retired 1960 and uh, 140 were built mm, so it's a relatively short span again most planes had a very short span in that time of history because aviation design was moving on so much so what have we got there a couple of are they turbo props or are they are they piston engines or uh, a couple of radial engines and oddly enough a jet engine as well oh my word i can't so i can't might have been a hybrid. I can't see the jet engine in my picture. I'm guessing they were inboard of the wings. Okay. Right. 1950. Uh, jet engine. Which Do we know what jet engines that was? Wikipedia is saying it had one Allison J33 uh, wow. turbojet. I don't even know where that is in the oh, design. It must be on the central. Um. Yeah. So somewhere there is one 
jet engine. We just have no idea. We can't see it. We can't see it. It was all from an intake. But apparently that was there. Okay. Weird, but okay. Uh, any facts? And they were made, so we must have facts and figures. We've got a height, a speed, and a bomb load. The service ceiling was 40,800. Mm -hmm. Speed was 471 miles per hour. Um, bomb load was 12,000 pounds of uh, conventional bombs, but also could carry one nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And that is actually a pretty impressive uh, payload, because we're talking several years before the Canberra, and we've got more payload. So that is itself fairly impressive. Um, slow old beast. Um, did you see any action in Korea, do we know? Or was it almost outdated by then? It doesn't look like it saw any sort of operational activity. Obviously, it was in service, uh, but I can't see any data about um, it act being active service. Roger. Now, I see a big sign saying Navy on it, and I see what looks like an arrest hook. So this was a carrier plane. It certainly looks like it was developed that way, uh, but as I understand it, uh, it was too big for the midway class of carriers at the time. Mm -hmm. and they had to fit it to um, um, sort of modernised uh, forestal Roger. to reinforce the decks to sort of to, to allow it to, to fit. It is a big aircraft to be operating off of the decks of, uh, of carriers. Mm, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, because I guess literally until then it was a it was Corsairs and stuff, wasn't it? You know, a third of the weight. So, okay, very good. Anything to add to the Savage? No. Uh, again, I mean, I'm trying to get some more information about this this jet. Um, yeah, that's weird. It seem, yeah, it seems to have been sort of fitted just sort of along the main sort of cord of the the fuel. Mm. Yeah, it'd have to be central because otherwise balance, etc. Yeah, very odd, very odd. It'd be good to get some more information about Yeah, that. so if anyone knows about this Savage, let us know, please. Right, we finished off column two, so that is this video done. That's a little bit more history explored and some facts and figures gained. Uh, thank you very much, Soames, for doing your duty and getting that. Um, you've got quite a good voice for this, actually, so it works well. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we're going to sign off now. I hope you enjoyed that. As soon as we get a chance, we'll crack on with the next one, which is B1s, T4... Uh, XP70, you know, the big daddies basically. Uh, but until then, we will see you later.